we can only make such a declaration because of the hope he has given us through his son, Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, without the Lord, the lyrics make no sense at all. I raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah. What does hallelujah mean? Anybody? Hallelujah. What does it mean? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, if we're going to praise the Lord, there's got to be a few things happen, right? There's got to be participation. There's got to be volume. There's got to be joy. And there's got to be belief. The first line of this song says, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a praise the Lord in the presence of my enemies. Say what? Without Jesus, the lyrics make no sense. Anybody bring any enemies with you this morning? You know, we always think of people. We think of enemies, don't we? Our enemies, temptations, the diagnosis, the bullying, the abusiveness, the loneliness, and we could go on and on and on with the list. They, they are enemies. And because of the hope and grace found in Jesus Christ, our enemies are temporary. They're temporary. And we can, with our enemies watching, sing a melody of hallelujah in the middle of the storm and watch the darkness flee. Are you with me, church? And you must stand and raise a hallelujah.
our Savior has done and the manner and way in which he did it. To imitate Christ's humility. He said, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard the of God as something to be used for his own advantage, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. In this we see the selfless humility of Christ and the incarnation of God, with Jesus becoming fully human while being fully God, the core foundational premise of our faith. Scripture says Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and was being made in the likeness of men. How did Christ empty himself? We know he didn't lose his deity. He was before the world began and will always be the eternal God. Nor did he lose his divine attributes or power, yet the King of kings and Lord of lords did empty himself for our gain. This is evident in Jesus' prayer found in John 17, 5. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. He emptied himself by giving up his divine prerogative, his choice, his will, and independent authority by completely submitting to the will of the Father. John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. He emptied himself by voluntarily accepting the limitations of becoming human. With genuine humanity come certain restrictions, the need to eat, obtain rest, sleep, to feel pain, to bleed, and yes, to die. Our Savior knew he would have to empty himself of the heavenly realms to connect with our human needs, giving up his glory for our guilt. Connecting with us in human form and likeness, he sympathizes with our weaknesses. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. He provides continual compassion and comfort. Praise be to the God and Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. By his humility we are saved and his love fulfilled toward us. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for your son and his perfect example of humility, obedience, and love. For leaving heaven and coming to earth, emptying and pouring out himself for us, that we may be filled with your grace and your truth. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen.
quick reminder that uh, as the kids are going to their classes, if you have a sixth grader or a seventh grader who you would prefer to go to class this week and next week uh, due to the, the, the nature of what we're talking about, they are welcome to, to go. And uh, want to do a couple of quick things before we get to the message. One is uh, I want to give a third week update on our Next Gen Minister search. Uh, it, it, you may remember um, we are going to repost the the listing for the, the ministry position uh, starting this week. And we want you to be in prayer of that. In fact, we want to ask you if you would be willing to pray and fast over that. And so on the table in the foyer, we have a sign-up sheet. Uh, there are several slots for each meal for, the, for this week. And we want to ask you if you would be willing to fast for, you can pick one meal. Uh, some people will pick a whole day. Uh, and we have, you know, it's fine to have multiple people signed up for, for a particular meal, but we want to, to, to try to have somebody signed up for each meal through this week, and it will probably be next week too, but we want to start uh, by filling up this week. And you can also sign up on the Church Center app. You can do it through there. If you get away from here today and, oh, I meant to do that, um, you can do that, that that way also. But this is important, and, and we, we want to ask you if you'd be willing to pray and fast. If you have physical conditions that might prevent you from, from fasting from food, I would encourage you to pick something that's important to you. And say, okay, God, I'm going to put this aside. Uh, and I'm going to spend the time I would spend doing this praying to you. And so I encourage you to sign up for that. Also, I want to encourage you, if you've not already signed up for our community groups, there are sign-up sheets on a, on a table in the, uh, the front wall in the foyer. Uh, and we're going to be doing a series called Messy Grace that's going to be a, a really good segue from what we're talking about in this sermon series to where we can sit around in smaller groups and talk through these things on a practical level. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of what it's like, I want to show you this, this short uh, introductory video featuring Kyle Idleman, who led the, the, the study that we just finished in the fall. He was a freshman, and I was a junior. He loved God, and I saw in Caleb someone who had this genuine love for people and wanted to make a difference in the world. I never heard a story quite like his before. As I got to the end of the parade, there were all of these Christians holding up signs saying, God hates you. God wants nothing to do with you. If that wasn't offensive enough, they were spraying water and urine over everyone as they marched by. My mom said, well, Caleb, they're Christians, and Christians hate gay people. I'm really not surprised that Caleb's book, Messy Grace, has already had such an impact and has received a lot of recognition. And in this video series, Messy Grace, you will experience Caleb's unique story and insights. But I'm really excited for you to be introduced to four people, to hear true stories of Christians who have been affected and impacted by LGBT identity and LGBT issues. I wanted people to tell me that I'm something, that I'm significant, that I'm somebody. And women, I think, uh, became one of the main sources of that for me. You meet Jackie Hill Perry. Since she's become a Christian, Jackie has been compelled to share the light of the gospel through poems and spoken word pieces, through rap videos that reached more than one million views on YouTube. I thought that because of my actions, that I was too far gone. I was the hypocrite of hypocrites. I'm also excited for you to meet Michael Salinas. He's a student at Texas State University. He shows wisdom beyond his years. And what I still appreciate about Michael is he just has this gentle and humble spirit as he talks to us about what God has taught him. You'll get to meet Margaret Philbrick. She is a teacher and author. Margaret's story is a little different from the others in the series. Here's how she puts it in her own words. She says, over dinner one night, my brother announced he was becoming a woman, and so began the greatest test of my faith. And you'll meet Sam Alberry. He lives a celibate life. He has some amazingly insightful things to say on this topic, and he has a British accent, so everything he says sounds inspired. I think the, the phrase I've heard the most has been self-deluded. The notion that you would live life without 
sexual fulfillment thought to be madness. Listen, you might not agree with everything you hear in this study. That's okay. I wouldn't expect you to, but my hope is that you will see their hearts. And that you will better understand their hurts and the way that God is using their stories, even in the messiness. And I know you're going to be challenged and you're going to be taught in this series as well. So I hope that if you have not signed up already, you will sign up for one group. Still have several groups left on different uh, uh, days and nights of the week. And uh, as we kind of continue this, this conversation on how we as Christians uh, can respond to the, the messiness of this world, especially when it comes to sexual issues. Uh, and as we've said in this series, if there are two main goals here. One is to preach the life-changing, life-giving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the best answer for life here and beyond. The other goal of this series is to let you know if you're wrestling with some of these issues or, or maybe you're not personally, but you have people close to you and then you're trying to, to, to work through these things yourself, then we're glad you're here. We, we are so glad that you're here with us as we open up God's Word. And this, this series has generated some conversations already. We're going to have more as we get into our community groups, but it's already generated some conversations and, and stories. As I shared last week about the first time I, I learned the, the truth about the biology of sex and how it worked, uh, Marilyn Anderson told us this week in, in our seniors group that uh, she was in fifth grade when she learned how things happened. She said uh, uh, one of the girls there had written it down on a piece of paper, as you did back then, passed a note. And the teacher intercepted the note and opened it up and looked at it and was shocked and said, pointed to the girl, not Marilyn, <laughs> and said, come with me to the office. And then for some reason, instead of taking the piece of paper with her as evidence, crumbled it up and threw it in the trash can. Well, you know what happened next. One of the boys jumped up. As soon as they, they got out of the classroom, jumped up, went over to the trash can, got the note, and straightened it out and read it to the class, to the gasps of the students in the class. And she said, so we said, well, that can't be right. And some weren't sure. And so she said, we did what all Americans did back then. We voted on it. <laughs> it didn't pass. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is, if they had taken a vote with those same people when they were in 11th grade instead of 5th grade, I think the result of the election might have been a little bit different, don't you? Because... Our minds change over time, and our culture has changed over time. We talked about that a little bit last week, how over the last 60 to 65 years, with the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, things have changed with regard to our views on sex and sexuality, and those things are running headlong into the standards of a God who Scripture says is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when that happens, there's tension, there's difficulty, and, and we're going to talk about the, the messiness of this as we lead into our small groups next week, but there's one issue that, that's just, it's kind of new to us because it, it's come on the scene a little more recently than, than some of the other issues regarding sex, and that's transgenderism. And that's the idea that your physical body doesn't match with what your mind says about you. And uh, with the idea of gender dysphoria, that, that you, you're, there's, a, there's a disconnect between the way you think about yourself and your physical body. And it probably, it had been building for, for a number of years, but it probably gained the biggest, its biggest push in 2015 when American Olympic hero Bruce Jenner appeared in an interview with Barbara Walters and then on the cover of Vanity Fair saying, I'm a woman now, call me Caitlin. And that, you take somebody who's a hero to so many people and publicize this, it just seemed to really, this was where things came 
to the to the fore, and people knew about it, heard about it more, and the number of people who subsequently came out and said they're transgender skyrocketed after this, especially among teenage girls, for 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 a number of reasons. The, the te within teenage girls, it just seemed like there was there was an explosion of people who said that they identify as transgender. And I, I want to try to explain the basics of this uh, in, in case maybe you're not as familiar with it. There's a there's a graphic that's used to describe the concepts because the the, the belief is by those uh, who who present this. That in the transgender community, they explain that uh, there is, there are four basic areas that each person have in their life, and there's a graphic they use called the genderbred person, and you may have seen this. This has been used in schools in a lot of places to describe uh, this this concept, and it, it, I know it's hard to see on here, but um, uh, but I want to just kind of walk you through the different areas that it says exist within us, that there are four different aspects of gender within us. And the first it says is our gender identity. And it defines it, and I'm going to read their definition so I don't misquote. It says, this is defined as how you in your head define your gender based on how much you feel you align with what you understand to be the options for your gender. And you can identify as male or female or somewhere in between regardless of your biological sex. So that's the idea of your gender identity. And with all of these, it, the, the belief is that they exist on a spectrum between male and female or somewhere in between. And they can change at any time. The second idea is the idea of gender expression. They say your gender expression is how you outwardly express your gender through the way you dress, uh, for, through your hair, uh, your, your clothes appearance, that's your gender expression. And that might be different from your gender identity. The third aspect is what we most people think of is, is our, our biological sex. And that's you know, our physical body. And then the fourth aspect is, our, is a person's attraction. So whether you're romantically attracted to masculinity or femininity or somewhere in between or neither. And the argument is that all of these things, uh, including biological sex, exist on a spectrum. And for one person, they might stay the same, or and for another person, they might change. And they don't all necessarily align. So your, you, your gender identity could be male, but your gender expression, you might express that in yourself as a female. While your biological sex may be male, but you may be attracted to males or females. And it, it, can, it can switch, it can change, uh, and is fluid all the time. And I, and I don't know about you, but as I go through that, I have to admit to some confusion. Especially when you ask someone, okay, so you're saying you're, you're, you're biologically male, but you say you're a woman. What is a woman? And to ask them to define it, because the, the best answer, or the closest thing to an answer I've seen, is for somebody to say, well, it's whatever a person imagines a woman to be. But the problem is, if a woman means any, anything in the world, then it really has no meaning whatsoever. So what does God say about this kind of confusion? 1 Corinthians 14 says this, God is not a God of what? Confusion. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. In other words, when we've gotten to, to where things are this confusing, then we've gotten away from God because he doesn't create confusion. So how did we get to this point? How did we get here? Well, gender is a term that came from grammar. I'm a grammar nut. My dad drove this stuff into me with a hammer as a kid. And gender was a grammatical term. Some languages, such as uh, French and Spanish, have words that are masculine or feminine, or some neuter. 
And so the word gender developed in grammar, and over time it became used interchangeably with sex when it was applied to a person. In, in English, we like to use different words for things so we don't hear the same word. We get bored hearing the same word to describe something all the time. So we've used gender and sex interchangeably. And for, for years and years and years, they were used interchangeably to refer to your biological sex. In, in the 1950s, a, a psychiatrist or psychologist from Johns Hopkins named John Money came up with a theory that said that people have a gender identity that's different from their biological sex. And even though the, the theory didn't catch on with most, with most people, he did some experiments on children that had horrible consequences, the idea did still gain traction within academia. And uh, so it was still kind of on the fringes of culture for a number of years until it sort of coincided with the ideas of the sexual revolution that we talked about last week, the idea that you find meaning with, only within yourself, in the way you feel, and specifically, you find your identity in your gender, in your sex. And so this idea that gender was different from your biological sex, that it may, it may align, but it may not align, came along. And that, that's kind of where we got to where we are. And over the last 10 to 15 years, that concept has gained a lot of political traction. Uh, so much so that, that laws are being passed in different states that to, to and, and laws, some of them push toward acceptance of it and some push away. And, and it developed based on these principles, some of these principles that we talked about last week. Uh, but also one additional principle that transgenderism really talks about, and that's the idea that you have a mind and a body and the two are completely separate from one another. You're, you have a mind where you do your thinking and, and your, your, your feeling, but then you have a body, a physical body, and your body is separate, and your body is just raw material. It has no moral value whatsoever. And so you can have a complete separation between the way your body is and the way your mind thinks. Well, I always start with, what does God say about these things? What does God say about our mind and our body? Well, Scripture says that we don't have just two aspects. We have three we have a mind, uh, we, we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Listen to what Scripture says. First Thessalonians 5.23, it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless before the Lord, before, uh, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're more than just a mind and a body that are separate. God says we are body, soul, and spirit, and they're interconnected. Our body, we know, is the material thing we see and, and we can touch. It's our flesh and bone. Our soul is, our, is the immaterial part of us. That's where we have uh, our mind and our emotions and our will. That's where we think. Uh, that's where we make decisions and, and feel things. But we also have an immaterial part of us that is spirit. That, that's where we connect with and communicate with God. And God says these three aspects of our life have distinction from each other, but they work together. That we are one, just like God is one. We read last week Genesis 1.27. It says, so God created man in his own image. We are created with these different aspects of us because we're created in the image of God. It says, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. So how did God create us? Male and female. So how many genders are there? There are two. Because God isn't a God of confusion. And when you think about it, you think about the way God created us, 
He created us this way, but he could have created us any way he wanted. He could have created our bodies exactly the same biologically. You say, well, how would we have had children? God could have done whatever he wanted. He could have, he could have done it in such a way that when you're ready to have a child, you could pop open your big toe and a baby would come out. <laughs> Silly example, but if he had wanted to, that's what he could have done. He created us. But he specifically created us, male and female, with bodies that were complementary. And even, even today, with all of our technological developments, it still requires a man and a woman to create a baby. Now, this is where some people will bring up the idea of intersex. Intersex is a very rare uh, birth defect where a child is born with the physical characteristics of both a male and a female. It happens, studies show, about two one-hundredths of one percent of the time. In other words, 98.98 percent .98 of the time, people born and it's clear, male or female. You say, well, how did these birth defects develop? And, and the answer is, we honestly just don't know. There are so many things that are not the way God created them. God created this world perfect. But once sin and disease and death and decay entered the world, so many things are different from the way God created them to be. And so we don't really know how birth defects of any kind, or, or of all kinds, we, we don't know how all of them happen. But here's the thing. In what other area do we pick a birth defect to inform God's creation? In other words, if, if a child is born without a hand, we don't say, well, that's a, that's a typical thing. And if a child sees another child doesn't have a hand and decides, you know what, I shouldn't have any hand either, we don't just go and chop it off. We, we don't approach any other aspect of life this way, except when it comes to to transgenderism and the idea that uh, our bodies are just raw material. We can do with them whatever we please. But God says that's not the case. 1 Corinthians 6, we read last week and we talked about how what we do with our physical bodies has a spiritual component. And then later on in verse 19, listen to what it says. It says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Your body is made in God's image. And he's redeemed us, so we belong to him. Body, soul, and spirit. They're connected. The body is not just a commodity to do with as you please. The central, and the central core aspect of the transgender issue is, okay, so what do you do when your mind and your body are at odds with one another? What do you do when there's a disconnect between the way you feel about yourself and your physical body? And if you're struggling with this concept personally, I just want you to know, you're not the only one. You want to know who else struggles with a war between our mind and body at times, even though they're connected. Look at Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, In my inner being, I delight in God's law. In other words, Paul says, In my mind, in my soul, I love God's law. I know it's the right thing. I know it's what's best for me. But then he says this, verse 23. But I see another law at work in the members of my body doing what? Waging war against the law of my mind. He says there's a war going on between my mind, which loves God and knows what he says and wants to serve him, and my body, which wants to sin. And here's the thing. Every single one of us has this war going on. Every single one of us can identify with what Paul says in Romans 7. Listen to what, how the Phillips paraphrase puts this. I like this. It says, my own behavior baffles me. Does that sound familiar? 
My own behavior baffles me, for I find myself not doing what I really want to do, but doing what I really loathe. He says, there's a war going on between my mind and my body. So what do you do when your mind and your body are at war? Well, culture says your mind can't change, so you have to change your body. Culture says if your body says you're male, but your mind says you're female, then your mind can't change, so you have to change your body. And the cultural push for this argument is so strong that there are actually laws that have been passed that if a child shows any kind of gender dysphoria, any kind of, of disconnect between or confusion about his gender, there are laws on the books in certain states that say you have to start them toward a regimen of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, which are irreversible. Regardless of the fact that studies have shown that children, when they have some sort of confusion or dysphoria about their gender, if they're left alone and they're not affirmed in that, they're just left and they're not uh, uh, transitioned, even socially, 88% of the time, they'll come to the point where they're accepting of their body and who they are. And yet, anybody who suggests any kind of normal therapy where they would sit down with a therapist and talk about what may be the source of this to see where it might come from, it's outlawed in some places and referred to as conversion therapy which is kind of Orwellian when you think about it. Lisa Marciano, who's a therapist, she said this about the situation. She said the whole premise of therapy is that you explore. It's that you open things up and you approach a symptom with curiosity. Affirmation is the opposite of curiosity. It's saying, I already know what this is, and taking things at face value. And without even allowing therapy to explore some of the causes what might be causing a child's depression or dysphoria, parents are often blackmailed with the claim that if they don't immediately affirm their child's dysphoria, then their child is likely to commit suicide. And they're given the false choice that you could either have a living son or a dead daughter, or vice versa. Listen to what Dr. Marciano, Marciano said. She said, if I work with someone who's really suicidal, because his wife left him. I don't call the wife up and say, hey, you just have to come back. That's not the way we treat suicide, she said. We don't treat suicide by giving people exactly what they want. We treat suicide, first of all, by keeping people safe and by helping them come become more resilient. So let's say I came home one day and I said to, to my wife, I said, Christy, you know, I have these feelings in me, and they're just natural. It's the way I feel. I just feel like I can't, I, I can't be with just one woman, and so I need you to understand that and let me be with multiple women, or I'm going to commit suicide. How do you think she'd respond? I don't want to know how she'd respond <laughs> to that. Right? That's emotional blackmail. Especially when you consider, if you, if you read uh, Abigail Shire's book, uh, Irreversible Damage, which I, I encourage you to do because it's got so much good information. But she cites studies on, on teenage girls that have shown that their mental state have, does not improve after going through puberty blockers and such. And the most cited study by transgender activists just to cite the, the benefits of affirming care, where you, as soon as a child shows any questioning at all, oh, that must mean you're trans. The, the most cited study is flawed in so many ways. For one thing, it doesn't study the biggest, uh, the biggest population of people suffering from gender dysphoria today, which is teenage girls. But the other aspect of it is, it talks about how, how their mental state is after they were going through puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, but it doesn't say anything, it doesn't study at all what their mental state was like before. 
So it doesn't really tell you anything. That would be like somebody saying, I went on a six-month diet of triple bacon cheeseburgers and I only weigh 175 pounds. Well, if you don't know what the person weighed before, that doesn't really tell you anything. Because if you weighed 120 pounds before, that'll tell you something different than if you weighed 220 pounds before. And yet, this is the study that's cited most often to support gender-affirming care, which is kind of an Orwellian term. The world says your mind can't change, so you have to change your body. God says, let me change your mind. Romans 12 says, give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he'll find acceptable. This is, the, is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. God says, you bring yourself to me, body, soul, and spirit. Place your life before me as an offering, and I'll work through the difficulties that you're having between your mind and body, where you want to sin, you want to go in this direction, and your body takes you in a different direction. Your, your desire to sin takes you in another. Now, let me stress that God doesn't promise that all of these changes will happen just like that overnight. I remember seeing Cy Rogers, who was uh, a minister who came out of transgenderism, came out of same-sex lifestyle, and he said, when I came to Christ, it wasn't like God just waved a magic wand and said, one, two, three, now you're free. Uh, go be straight, date and mate. Boom. He said, it didn't happen that way. He said, but as I grew closer to Christ, and I wanted to align myself with his mind, then I began to see a change in my mind and my heart. And that doesn't necessarily mean that your feelings and your your uh, who you're drawn to, it may change, it, it may not. But the thing is, that's not the point. The point is us developing our relationship with God and seeing that you satisfy me beyond anything in this world. And I trust you to take care of my needs. And the idea that we would change the body, which can't really be changed, science will tell you that you cannot change because no matter what surgeries you may have, every cell in your body has either XX or XY chromosomes and they can't change. But we're told by our culture today that if there's a disconnect between the mind and the body, that the body that can't really change has to be changed because the mind, which they'll admit gender identity and, and can change day to day with a person, somehow or another that's immutable. Day is night, night is day, and up is down. And this gets pushed on children, and that's the scary part of this. Even non-Christians understand that it makes no sense to make physical changes, life-altering and irreversible changes to a child just because of feelings that they have. Bill Maher, who's definitely not a Christian or a political conservative, said this. He said, kids are fluid about everything. If they knew at age eight what they wanted to be, the world would be filled with cowboys and princesses. He recalled, I wanted to be a pirate. Thank God no one scheduled me for eye removal and peg leg surgery. If a teenage girl weighing 60 pounds walks into a doctor's office and says, Doctor, I need your help. I am so obese. It's horrible. I, I need your help to lose weight. How would the doctor respond? Would he say, you are absolutely right. I'm going to start you on a regimen of appetite suppressants and I'm going to get you scheduled for gastric bypass surgery. Is that what he'd do? Of course not. He would say, I want you to sit down with a therapist so that we can help you align, realign your mind to the reality of how your body is so that we can get those two things in sync. And we see this in every other issue. 
except when it comes to this. And we see this and we point this out because we care about people and we hate seeing people lied to. Now, I will say this, and this is something that every one of us who's a Christian and has never struggled with this needs to understand. Some of us have contributed, often unwittingly, to people having confusion in this area. And that comes when someone, especially a child, doesn't act and do all the, the stereotypical things of a child of his sex does. So a boy maybe doesn't like to roughhouse, doesn't like to wrestle, doesn't like to play football, doesn't like sports. Maybe he prefers music. Maybe he prefers art. And so often, what will the other boys do? They'll bully him, they'll ridicule him, they'll ostracize him, and they'll say, you're not a real guy. You're not really a boy. You're not a guy. Same thing happens with girls at times. If, they, if you have a girl and she likes uh, sports, she likes cars, she doesn't like wearing dresses and things like that, what we used to call a tomboy, so often she'll be ridiculed by the other girls. Oh, you're not really, you're not really a girl. And, and this has got to stop. Folks, King David played the harp. He wrote poetry. He danced. Does that mean he's less of a man? Deborah was a warrior. She led troops into battle. She was fierce. Did that make her less of a woman? No. And so we have to, we have to recognize. And, and I just want to say, if you're, if you're a guy, if you're a, a male and you're struggling with this or you've been dealing with this kind of, of bullying. Maybe you, you don't care for sports. Maybe you like reading and you, you like drama. You like plays or you like art in some way. I want to tell you something that you desperately need to hear. And that's this. That you are a man. And your best life will be lived as a man God created you to be. If you are a female and you like football, and cars, and action movies, and hunting. Do you know what that makes you? It makes you awesome is what it makes you. I stole that joke, but it's totally true. It doesn't make you less a woman. You are a woman, and you, your best life is going to be lived as the woman God created you to be. Your Heavenly Father loves you. He created you, and he loves you so much that when he saw you struggling in your sin, he stepped down from heaven, and he sacrificed himself. He went through unspeakable torture to take your punishment on himself. That's how much he cares about you. He created you. Scripture says he knit you together in your mother's womb, and he loves you more than anyone else ever will. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the love you have for us. And I thank you for the fact that even though all of us have times where our mind wants us to go in one direction, our body wants us to go in another, and we have that struggle there, that you understand that. You care about that whether it's a gender issue or other, uh, other aspects of our life, areas where we, where we sin against you, that you care about that. And you've told us that you're going to offer a solution that if we give ourselves to you totally, body, soul, and spirit, and place our lives before you as an offering, that you'll walk beside us and you will help to begin to change our mind and to align our mind with yours. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the love you showed when you gave yourself for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. That idea of laying your life before God, it starts with a declaration of, Lord, you know, I know I've sinned. I, I 
know I need you, your forgiveness. And if you've never made that decision, we're going to offer you the opportunity to do that. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing a song of invitation. If you have a decision to make, would you make this to stand together and sing?
want to thank you for being with us. And uh, you know, we offer an invitation at the end of the service, but the invitation never closes. And if you are thinking about your relationship with God, want to ever want to come and talk about that, you you can talk about that with me anytime, and I'd be glad to do that. If you're dealing with uh, questions you have about some of the things we're talking about, I'd be glad to talk with you about that. I really encourage you to sign up for one of the groups because we're going to. Uh, learn a lot and, and have some good discussions. Uh, and also, uh, don't forget to uh, about fa pra fasting and praying this week for the next gen minister as we uh, repost that position. Pray that, that this would be part of your prayer time this week, and that you would sign up on there just so we we can have the encouragement of seeing people uh, willing to put things aside to pray uh, to grow God's kingdom here. God bless. Have a great week.